Thank you. Good morning, all. Uh, thank you to the advisory board for inviting me and for all the organizers and sponsors for making this happen. As you can imagine, these kinds of events don't just happen serendipity. So I'm here to talk to you guys about complex systems and what are its implications for data science, machine learning, et cetera. The first part of the uh, work that I'll be talking about is with these fine people, Leo Torres, who is my student, Anne Sizemore, and Danny Bassett. And you can read more about it if you're interested in this article that was published in Siam Review. So some of you may know that the physics Nobel Prize in 2021 went to the study of complex systems, and in particular in the advances that we made in terms of global warming. And I know that the panel is going to be about climate change. So you should really think not just in terms of algorithms, but in terms of complex systems. So what is a complex system? At its basic levels, you have lots of um, instances or objects, and they interact with each other in a complex way. And I really like this book. And even though the, both of the authors are my friend, I don't get a kickback for pushing their book. <laughs> but one of the reasons I like their book is that they talk about complex systems like an ant colony like your brain, uh, like the World Wide Web, in terms of features. And we data scientists really like features. And so when you think about a complex system, it has some necessary conditions. So you're going to have randomness. You're going to have disorder. You're going to have numerosity. There's going to be lots of objects of different types. There's going to be diversity. There's going to be feedback in the system. There's going to be non-equilibrium. And then what you have is some emergent behavior, such as history, such as self-organization. In our society, oftentimes we self-organize, nested structure, et cetera. And then some features of the function of the system, whether the system has adaptive behavior, your brain is very adaptive, right, et cetera, et cetera. And so why am I telling you about complex systems and why should you care about complex systems? Again, because your algorithm or the computer system, the data science system that you're generating is not an island. It's part of a bigger system. Imagine, for example, all the recommendation algorithms that we have out there, right? The, um, for example, Amazon will recommend something to you. Perhaps you'll be persuaded to buy it. That affects the economic processes or you're on one of these dating apps and it recommends who you should go on a date with and that affects our social processes. And of course, we are all very aware of recommendation systems on social media and how that affects our political system. And so the one thing, if you're gonna take one thing out of this talk is that whatever you're developing is not an island, right? It's part of a bigger system. And in fact, it's part of our society. And so with uh, Carolyn Wiesner, and lots of other folks, we had um, some papers on the fact that the algorithms and the systems that you're generating are part of our democracy, which is a complex system. And so when we have, for example, democratic backsliding, it's instability in this complex system. So what is a prototypical analysis pipeline for a complex system? So there's some phenomena that is happening. You're interested in it. The first thing you should ask is, what are the dependencies in this system? Right? Then you think about, well, OK, how am I going to represent this data? Alas, especially in academia, um, I would say data scientists, machine learning people, don't question where the data came from as much right? or the processes that generated that data. Um, data is a second class citizen, which it really shouldn't. You really th need to think about where this data came from and how you're going to represent it. And then after you represent it, this is actually usually where the machine learning enters, where you have the data, you have your task, and you're like, okay, well, which mathematical or statistical model is best going to represent this phenomena, and what is my objective function, and well, uh, what kind of optimization algorithm am I going to use? And then, of course, int interpretation of the results are extremely important. For those of you who are in industry, I'm sure you're like, yeah, you know, when I go talk to somebody, I need to um, um, be able to explain something to them. So in, uh, in the fall, I was attending this workshop on graphs, and this graph theory, very mathematical, oriented person was giving a talk, and somebody in the audience asked them, can you give me a killer application? And they said, Oh, I have a killer application. 
suppose you have a sequence of random graphs where they're locally bounded, otherwise infinite. Well, that is not an application, right? <laughs> so when you need to be able to figure out um, the level at which you're talking and being able to interpret your computational results. Okay, so what dependencies exist in your system? I'm only gonna talk about three of them. One is, are subsets implied, right? So if three of us write a paper together, then any pair on that three are also, are, are also co-authors, right? Um, the other one is, should I worry about time? And also at what scale, right? And the last one is, whether I should care about space, whether when two things are near each other, that actually has some signal that I can use for whatever inference I want to make. So just to drive these points home, let's look at the first one, right? So here, um, and I'm gonna talk more in terms of complex networks because I see everything in terms of nodes and links, right? Um, if you think about it, um, complex networks, that usually in data structure we represent them as graphs, they're everywhere, right? They're the social networks, they're the technological networks, they're information networks, they're biological networks. Everything is related to each other. If you take out that relationship, you're trying to make it easier for yourself and easier for the algorithm, but there are relationships that exist and are important to think about. So here, I'm just showing you some colored objects, and while um, these two, right, these two squares have different colors, um, they're still squares, right? So that subset dependency exists. This doesn't, it, uh, it's not always given. So here I'm showing you some molecules. The molecules are the nodes and the reactions are the chemical reactions. And so you can have some, a set that's a subset of another. The bigger set is part of the relations here, chemical reactions, but uh, the subset isn't, right? And so you, one needs to think about whether these subset dependencies exist or not, because if they do exist, then you really want to be able to represent them. The next one was temporal. I was talking about temporal aspects. So suppose this is uh, this one on the top here. Oops, this one on the top here is uh, your actual subway map. But what you only get are these passenger commutes. And somebody tells you infer the uh, subway map. Well, if your representation doesn't take time into account, no matter how strong, how powerful your data science, your machine learning is, you're not gonna get the right answer, right? The reason being, you're not gonna get the transfer points, right? And so somebody then will get on A and thinking, oh, I don't need to transfer, I can get to G, right? And then of course, there are these notions of space, and in particular, for example, when you're studying the human brain, or if you're interested in diseases, I know the panel is on global health, I imagine we're gonna talk about the pandemic a bit, so you can represent them as separately. Oh, I have space and I have some other kind of a network or something else, some, um, some relational information. But if you put them together, then you're able to see the bigger picture, that perhaps things that are close to each other have similar properties. And there are lots of other kinds of dependencies that you should worry about. And I know that maybe to some of you, the, this is all like window washing. Like, why should I think about it? I only want to think about the algorithm, right? But if you really think about it, your algorithms are being used in society. So you should care about it from A to Z, right? From the beginning to the end of it. And so one of the things is the availability of data. And I know that all of the folks that come from industry are probably aware of this, right? However big your data is, it's, it's gonna be incomplete. You're not omniscient. My apologies for giving you that news, right? And so there's lots of these issues of, okay, well, if I have some budget, how would I go collect more data so as to figure out what are the dependencies in my data? There's also lots of, obviously, costs to getting your data, and as you process it, you inadvertently will add some dependencies into it. So if you think about, for example, co-authorship, really what you have is authors and papers, right? And then what you do is you take that matrix, you multiply it by its transpose, and now you have a co-authorship network. When you do that, you're introducing lots of triangles that weren't there before. And so in it, inadvertently, you're adding these dependencies that you should be aware of. And lastly, obviously, whatever question you have is extremely important. So if you're interested in could a common food have caused a disease outbreak, you should really care about time and space, right? And the birth rate and the death rate of that disease and et cetera, et cetera. 
OK, so now suppose you've gotten to a point where you understand the dependencies of your system that you're interested in studying. Now it comes to the point of, oh, well, what kind of representation should I use, right? You're all probably familiar with graphs. You have nodes and links, right? A node could be a person. A link could be friendship. And so usually with these kinds of graphs, we're interested in cliques, right? In, in triangles, for example, right? A friend of a friend is a friend. Or for example, if you and I have a lot of common friends, but we're not friends, then that's a signal that perhaps we didn't want to be friends, right? There were lots of opportunities for us to be friends, and we chose not to be friends, right? And so paths are important. And then, if you have these kinds of um, subset dependencies, you should care about what's called simplicial complices. Because if I represent, for example, a co-authorship graph in terms of a simplicial complex, then I know that these three actually publish the paper together, as opposed to just the pairwise comparisons. Right? And then there's this notion of a hypergraph where exclusively a bunch of people work together. right? And, but Unfortunately, hypergraphs do not have the subset dependency, right? And so thinking about which framework you're going to use for the dependencies of your data is extremely important, and I'll talk about why it is. But just giving you an example of the different aspects of this, so one of the authors, Danny Bassett, is a very well-known um, network neuroscientist. Um, and so suppose you want to study the human brain, and four regions of the human brain with respect to four tasks, right? And whether those regions fire or not. And so if I were to represent it as just this simple graph, all I'm going to get is pairwise relationships, right? That these two regions co-fire when um, Tina is doing task one. If I represent it as subset dependencies, then I can try to capture a notion of what's called higher order, which is like, oh, these three regions fire all together for this particular task. And then if I represent it as a hypergraph, is that it's exclusive, that these three regions exclusively fire together for a particular task. And depending on what representation you pick, you can answer different questions. And so there's obviously lots of work in what's called network neuroscience, because there is a network in your brain, right? It's the connectome. In terms of what questions we can answer about our human brain and how can we um, use that, for example, to improve mental health, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, there are lots of other ways of representing the system that you're interested in. For example, directionality. I follow you on Twitter, but you do not follow me back. There is weighted. How many times did I call you? There's this notion of the, the world moves on, right? There's a temporal notion. There's a dynamic notion. And the scaling uh, matters a lot. So when you hear something like, oh, there's dynamicity here, or there's temporal process here, you really need to think about, well, at what scale is that data being generated? Because then you need to think about at what scale am I going to analyze it, right? Then there's this notion of multiplex and multi-layer networks, where, for example, I have the same, for multiplex, I have the same number of people, but I'm looking at when they call each other, right? I'm looking at their call graph, I'm looking at when they meet together, or I'm looking at SMS, right? And one of the things which is interesting is that people, for example, who call a lot usually don't SMS a lot, right? And so to try to study different relationships that the same people have. And then in multi-layer, you do not need to have the same um, level, the, the same set of um, objects or people, right? And this is oftentimes worked on in terms of, for example, you have the physical layer, you have the social layer, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so if, for example, something happens with a physical layer, how would that affect the social layer? And there are these higher order um, networks where you really care about memory. So there are lots of different ways of representing these. OK, so suppose you pick a framework. And so I want to talk a little bit about this, that as soon as you pick a particular mathematical framework to represent your system, you have put yourself in a hole. So if I take a hypergraph and I say, OK, I'm just going to reduce it into a graph because, for example, doing a hypergraph uh, deep uh, network is going to be difficult for me and I don't want to deal with it. Well, when I go that way, I'm going to lose information. And when I take a graph and I go the other way to make it a hypergraph, I'm going to make some assumptions, right? So when I see three people here, when I see a triangle here, I'm going to fill it and I'm going to assume that 
there's actually more than pairwise relationship between these guys. So why is this bad? Well, the reason being that these two hypergraphs are not the same, right? So it's not as easy as, <coughs> excuse me, going from a hypergraph to a graph and then going back and saying, oh, I'm fine. I can just go from one representation to another and not have any issues. And this affects also your insights, right? And what you see and what you report to people as like, what did I find in your data, right? So let's look at this. So here I'm showing you a small graph with five nodes, a simplicial complex with five nodes, and a hypergraph with five nodes. And so the takeaways are slightly different in that, for example, for this one, you'll say, oh, this green node has four direct neighbors and two triangles, right? And then here you're like, oh, this uh, green node has four direct neighbors, but one of the two triangles are special. It's a two-plex. And here, this hypergraph, this node is only, only has two direct um, connections. It doesn't have four direct connections. It has two direct connections, and uh, it connects to two others through a hyperedge. Now, why should you care about this? Let me show it to you in a bigger graph. Depending on how you represent this, your takeaways are going to be different. So if you represent it as a simple graph that we all know and love, like, oh, look, there's going to be core nodes and periphery nodes. And we see this a lot in social networks, right? There's a core group of people, and then there are people who support them on the periphery. But if I represent it as a simplicial complex, then you're like, oh, wait. Then it looks like it, there's a big circle in, in the middle there, where if I want to go from one group to another group, it's going to take me more resources. And then if I represent it as a hypergraph, you're like, oh, look, there's two communities, right? And these, are, these do not correspond to core and periphery. So depending on how you represent the system, your takeaway, what you tell people is going to be different, right? And the decisions that they make on that is going to be different. And so really caring about those dependencies and picking the right framework is the thing to go, right? And in fact, I just came back from a UCLA IPAM, Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics workshop, on AI and discrete optimization, right? Most of data science machine learning is about optimization. And so I'm sure you've heard about using machine learning to do optimization. And so usually machine learning for optimization works if the structure of, for example, your deep network is faithful to the problem that you're trying to solve. Otherwise, it's very difficult to make it perform well. And so when you think about this, there's lots of other questions to ask. So there's this notion of, uh, so we really care about triangles in these complex systems, in these complex networks. And so if I go with, for example, a simplicial complex where a shaded triangle is different than an unshaded triangle, then how do I keep count of clustering coefficient? This notion of how many triangles I have over how many possible triangles do I have? How do I treat a shaded triangle versus an unshaded triangle? How do I measure diameter, which is uh, the longest, shortest path in a graph, when I have hyper edges of different sizes? Or how do I deal with um, communities where basically clustering? of instances in these kinds of representations if I have a simplicial complex that has subset dependency versus I have a hypergraph where I don't, right? These are all choice points that if you make the wrong decision will come and bite you <laughs> later, right? So, and these are kinds of things that oftentimes, at least in academic papers, are not described as much, which they should, right? Because then at least I know where I stand, and when I try to reproduce it, and if it doesn't work, then I know why it's not working. And lastly, and most importantly, like we humans are able to transition from one representation to another representation very quickly, but in terms of where our data science is, we cannot transition quickly from one to another or know when I need, for example, a graph representation and when I need a hypergraph uh, representation. But in my brain, I quickly am able to switch between them and figure out what is going on. And so that is an open question to answer. And then, of course, there's the insights, right, which are extremely important. That's the, the, the holy grail of data science. And so let me give you a few examples, and then I'll move on. Um, so I've been talking a lot about co-authorships, right? So all my data is really papers and authors. And oftentimes, we represent these as 
for example, a matrix. Here I'm not taking time into account. Of course, time is important. And again, depending on how I represent it, I can answer different questions, right? So if I represent it as a simple graph, then I can ask, like, has this pair of authors uh, written a paper together? If I represent it as a simplicial complex, I can look at it, did this set of authors work together? And if I represent it as a hypergraph, then have this set of authors exclusively work together? And so one of the research questions that we're answering in my group right now is in terms of academic hiring, right? So academic hiring, as you can imagine, tenure track and tenured positions are advantageous positions in this society. And John Rawls, who was a very famous professor at Harvard, had this theory of, a, um, of a fair equality of opportunity where advantageous positions should be independent of, for example, your social economic status. So it should be based on your talent. So what we're trying to figure out is how important are these co-authorship networks and these social networks in terms of getting to an advantageous position in academia. And if you were to intervene to make it fair, equality of opportunity, because we know it is not, how stable is that system? Or does that system revert back to, for example, um, being, oh, well, Tina worked with this person. This person knows her, so she will get that position, right? And so if you think about, for example, these co op strip networks, we looked at uh, DBLP. A lot of you probably know about the CS bibliographic uh, database. And so we looked at just one year. And one of the things that you often do with these kinds of data structures, whether it's a graph, simplicial complex, or a hypergraph is you measure degree. So like how many of the nodes in this network are connected to um, K other people. And so what we see is that the correlations are indeed different and that is what you would expect, right? So when I look at the correlation between a hypergraph which captures polyadic relationships versus a graph that's dyadic only pairwise, then they, they're not as highly correlated with each other. So the data is telling you different things, and so you need to care about it. Or for example, we looked at emails in institutions, and here n is the number of people that were on that email. So up here, for example, we looked at emails that had between five and 25 participants, and we wanted to know if I measure this notion of clustering, because we are all very interested in clustering, right? A grouping of things, we use it a lot to find patterns. How different is the clustering between representation in a graph and a representation in the hypergraph. And you see no patterns, no, no direct patterns that you can say, oh, well, look, they're correlated, and so I can take advantage of it. We also looked at this notion of how much the communication within the team um, is coherent with their communication outside of the team. How, ma how many times do they talk to the people outside in this finite set? And again, we didn't see that much um, patterns, right? There's no patterns of the colors that you're seeing here. And so, again, depending on which representation you pick, you are going to get different insights, and that is important. Okay, so this is the bigger pipeline picture. So what? You may say, so what? So the takeaway is, um, even when your research question is fixed and you have access to the full data and there are little or no interaction among the types of dependencies that you have, this choice of representation alone can affect the results that you get and what you tell people and whether you're right or wrong and whether the decisions that they make, especially in these life-altering situations, as I'm sure you know, a lot of the algorithms are now being used in criminal justice, in school assignment, et cetera, in medicine, for example. Um, you will get different results. And so the takeaway home is your data science system, your algorithm is a part of a complex system. There's no perfect way to analyze a complex system. And the modeling decisions that you make do not necessarily transfer, right? This is why in data science and machine learning, we talk a lot about out of distribution scenarios, right? That the machine did not see. And even from the same process, if I get in other um, data, um, I cannot use the same modeling assumptions necessarily, right? So the data, if I, if I looked at the American society 25 years ago versus now, the modeling decisions I made then uh, are not 
appropriate now, as you can imagine. So you may say, look, I have a machine learning system that learns the appropriate representation for me, right? You may say, look, where have you been? There's all this discussion about encoding, embedding, representation learning. I'm good to go. I don't need to do this. I got the data. Machine will figure it out for me. Well, there is an issue with that. And the, let's talk about it. I like, about, I like graphs and networks. So let's think about graphs, right? So there's this notion of node embedding or Sometimes people call it graph embedding, where I have, let's say, a social network. And because that network is high dimensional, I want to map the people into a low dimensional space, right? So that's all I'm doing. I'm, I, I have a graph, let's say 100,000 by 100,000. And what I want to do is every person in that graph, I want to put them in some lower dimension, two to the power of something. <laughs> Usually it's two to the power of something, right? And then what happens is now I have this nice vector representation for my people, and that's what machine learning folks like, right? Then I can do classification, I can do clustering, I can do link prediction, what Tina liked the scarf, et cetera, et cetera, right? Recommendation. Well, one of the questions that we asked with my student David Liu was how sensitive are these node embeddings to graph perturbations, right? And why should you care about this? The reason you should care about this question is that, again, your data is incomplete and noisy, right? Um, and so the data that you are getting is not the ground truth. You don't even know which, which parts of the distribution this data is coming from. I know it's big, but for example, if I give you a very big data set and they're all ones, that's, that's no use, right? It could be very huge, but they're all ones, right? I can compress it down very easily. So the original question was how sensitive are these node embeddings, representation learning as they call it, to these graph perturbations? And so oftentimes the original question that you're asking is too abstract, and you, so you need to make it um, a little less abstract. And so a common approach that I'm sure you've all learned in your numerical analysis is to measure its sensitivity, right? So if I change the input, how much does the output change? And we've all seen this in terms of the showers <laughs> that we've taken, right? You change it a little bit, and now you're, you're burnt, right? So we change this to how would this embedding of the nodes change if for just the, for just the, the degenerate core, and I'll talk to you why you should care about this, um, if we were to change the periphery of this network. So we wanted to, in particular, know how the graph is changing, how the data is changing. Oftentimes in real life, you don't know what kind of data you saw. So this is when you actually know how your data is missing. And so let's see what, what happens. So just some notation, when you get a graph, there's this notion of k core, which is the maximal subgraph where every node has degree at least k. And so what you can do is, then is what's called sh uh, shaving or peeling this graph by removing some of the outer layers. So think about the onion, right? And you are taking the layers out. So one core will have everybody who has degree at least one. You can shave that one core, and then you get to your two core, where everybody has two, and so on and so forth. Now, if you go all the way down to the max k in your graph, that's called the degenerate core. And the nodes in that are important uh, because they have a lot of activity in your network. And so we and others have shown that these degenerate cores are not cliques. They're not all connected to each other. In fact, they have some structure to them. Um, if you're interested in activism, um, the degenerate core really depends on the periphery. That's the last work that's there. And also, if you're interested in, for example, online communities, there are people where when you remove them, and those oftentimes are in these dense subgraphs, the entire community falls apart, right? And so you should care about that. And I have this slide where if you look at the green nodes, they, have, uh, they are part of a three core, right? They each have degree at least three. But if I include this red node, then they're all uh, part of a three core. But if I take the red node out, the red node is special, so it doesn't have to have degree three. It's called anchored. But if I remove the red node, then all the blue nodes go away. Right? And, and the people that I'm observing are a lot less. So this is what we did. Um, we took a graph. The, the graph actually is a very famous graph that you're seeing up top. It's, it's called the Karate, the Zachary Karate Club graph. 
where there was a karate club, the instructor and the administrator had a fight, and the graph <laughs> broke into two communities, right? So that's what you're seeing. And the degenerate core are the blue nodes that you are looking at. So I'm going to shave it the same way as I was saying in terms of an onion, peeling this network from the outside to the inside. And so what I'm showing you on the bottom is one of the very popular methods. It is called node to vec, as in, you know, there's always these things where you're going from something to a vector representation, oftentimes Euclidean, because we like Euclidean spaces, though it doesn't have to be. Now, the scales on the x and y axes are the same. And one of the things that you see is that as I shave this graph, the blue nodes all of a sudden are, are in very different places, right? So the vector representation for the blue nodes that you're going to be using for your downstream task is extremely different. In fact, the way to think about it is that these representation learnings that you're doing, they're not absolute. It's not like, oh, Tina belongs in this space, right? It's usually that Tina belongs in this space with some epsilon radius, right? And you should take that uncertainty into account in your downstream task of, you know, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, self-supervised learning, whatever you are doing. And so you, whenever you're thinking about measuring these kinds of sensitivities or insensitivity, we, we're calling it instability here, so you have to have some kind of a measure and we were interested in the nodes that fall in this degenerate core because they have a lot of activity. So the measure that we came up with was, I'm just going to measure pairwise in terms of how much the, their vector space of the nodes that fell in this degenerate core changed, right? So for example, in this chart, for all the blue nodes, I'm going to measure their distances, right? And then I'm going to measure this distance, and then I'm going to see, I'm going to make a distribution of it, and I'm going to see how much did that distribution change. And that's basically what we did. And this way, you, you know, you're able to capture changes in symmetry, et cetera, because you don't want to be sensitive to that. And so that's what we do. I have my degenerate core. I have my nodes. I embed them. I measure the pairwise distances between them. I make a distribution. Then I shave it, I do the same thing. I say, okay, how, how much of the earth do I need to move from this distribution to the next, right? I'm sure you've all heard about the earth mover distance or the Wasserstein metric. So what did we find, right? Okay, we looked at a bunch of data and a bunch of algorithms. The one thing, again, this is a problem in academia in particular, um, uh, is that, for example, you read a paper and they're like, oh, we tested our data set, uh, our algorithm on these 100 data sets. But how much of the actual space did you examine with your algorithm? So we picked data set, both synthetic and not, and, and quote unquote real world data, to be able to cover this space. So on the y-axis, you're seeing the graph degeneracy. That's the k and the max k and the k-core. On the uh, x-axis, you're seeing a notion of entropy, which goes from 0 to 1. Closer to 1, it means this, this core group, this dense uh, uh, subgraph, this degenerate core, is well connected to the rest of the graph, and zero means not. And so we are trying to look at this space and try to have data that covers this space well. And then we picked our algorithms. I showed you a bunch of algorithms. We picked those algorithms based on this excellent survey that came out of the Google Graph team. And in particular, we're looking at the top half. So we're looking at graph embeddings. It's unsupervised. As you can imagine, teachers are hard to come by, especially good teachers. Uh, we do not have attributes on the nodes. Uh, I know in real life you have a lot of attributes. And then we're looking at encoding of this data, right? And so the algorithms that we picked were algorithms, so a couple from SkipGram, a couple from matrix factorization, a couple from the non-Euclidean, where you can map your data into a hyperbolic space. If you have a social network with a lot of stars, think of Beyonce as a star, right? You want hyperbolic spaces because they have enough capacity to store somebody like Beyonce. And then you and one from the Laplacian representation of the data. So what did we find? We found three patterns. One, the nodes in this degenerate core are affected when you remove the shells. And I already showed you one example of it. So here is the last FM who follows whom network. And so on the x-axis, you're seeing the pairwise distances between the nodes in the degenerate core. On the y-axis, you're seeing the density, how many 
of these pairwise distance values I had. And you can see that as I shifted from K9 to K13, something happened to this distribution, right? And here I'm plotting you the K for the K core and the earth mover distance and for all the different methods that we tried, including PCA, by the way, right? So PCA is also an embedding method, right? It's projecting and it's been around for 300 years. And again, you see that there seems to be a shift around 11, 13. And I'll talk about what that corresponds to. The other one was, so we use a lot of synthetic networks. And so, but we, we didn't see this pattern in the synthetic networks that we have. And in particular, one of the things that we observed was that these dense um, subgraphs, in particular the degenerate core, if it's a large portion of your data, then you would not expect the shift that we saw, for example, with the last FM. And, then, and, and lastly, as you remove the periphery, what happens to the pairwise distances of the nodes that you care about because they're in this dense subgraph, it becomes smoother. So here I'm showing you the English Wikipedia network. Again, on the x-axis here is the pairwise distance. On the y-axis is the density. And you see that, for example, as I go from K1 to K49, the number of bumps that you see in this distribution reduces. And here I'm showing you again the K for the K core. And on the y-axis, you're seeing the dip statistics that shows how unimodal your distribution is. And again, as you shade this graph and it becomes less complex, you see this as being different, as not being having a lot of bumps. And so, okay, it seems like all of these kinds of node embeddings are sensitive to this notion of um, not seeing the data, right? This kind of partial observability. What is the key driver of this? And so the key, uh, the key driver of it is that as you're shaving this graph and getting rid of people, if your edge density increases, then you know that you're going to be in trouble because the nodes in this important core are moving. And so I'm showing you the Facebook graph. For the Facebook graph, um, the, the change occurs between 70 and 71. For the last FM, it occurs from 15 to 16. And we ran a little regression on some of the key features of a graph that one would care about. And we saw that indeed edge density is the thing to think about as opposed to size. And many of the work that people do in terms of out of distribution scenarios, they just look at the size of the data. And that is not enough. You really need to look at the characteristics of the data. And in fact, you can prove some theorems. Of course, you need randomness, so this is just for a random graph, that as the edge density increases, then the difference between your loss, loss function in terms of machine learning, um, gets smaller. And so what did we find? We found that you may say, oh, I don't care about representation. I'm going to do learning on the representation, at least for node embeddings that are used all the time. You need to worry about how much of the data you've seen and how sensitive are these vector representation of your data to missing values. And we present an algorithm for trying to make your uh, embeddings more stable. And of course, there are many other forms of instability. Many of you uh, use this notion of negative sampling. There's lots and lots of negative examples. Which one are you going to pick? All right. And the choice on that negative sampling will affect your downstream results. And so you need to be careful about why you're doing that sampling that way and what assumptions are you making. So for example, are you doing your negative sampling from a ZIF distribution with uh, the parameter value three quarters? And why three quarters? Because like it did well on your data, like why would that generalize? So this is the big picture. You really need to care about the dependencies in your data. You need to care about what framework you use in terms of the mathematical framework because it affects the analysis that you get. And if you go from one to another, um, you're going to either lose information or you're going to make assumptions. And machine learning is not the panacea here, right? And my last slide, and I don't expect you to read this, but a lot of these discussions that are happening right now in terms of like chat, GPT, et cetera, et cetera, people have actually thought about these. This is Karl Popper, a very famous philosopher of science. He had this book, Conjectures and, and Refutations, back in 1962. I wasn't even born then. And um, so he's talking about building an induction machine. This would be a machine learning system. And he says, we must build into a machine a framework determining what is relevant or interesting in its world. Machine will have its inborn selection 
principles, right? When I pick a simplicial complex and I learn a machine learning system on it, I'm telling it there's subset dependencies that you should care about. The problems of similarity will have been solved by its maker who thus have interpreted the world for the machine, right? And so this is, you're still giving it that what is similar, what is not similar with the representation that you pick. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. It was very nice. Uh, so one uh, thing I'm curious about is once you do this K-core kind of a thing, how do you relate it back to the thing you started with? Like how does it relate to some recommendation algorithm? Are you suggesting that instead of using the initial graph, let's say do collaborative filtering using a new matrix which is derived from this K-core integration or something else? So one thing that you could do is um, you get some data, you decide to represent it as a graph, right? You could try to do this shaving while you're embedding to see how much of the people that are important to you, whether they're in the degenerate core or not, how much their vector representation changes. If their vector representation changes immediately for lower k, then you should be worried about the fact that maybe the vector representations that you're getting for the down downstream recommendation task may not be the quote unquote true representations, right? Because a lot of this embedding or representation learning is that there's this lower dimensional latent space that is generating my data. And if I find the actual one, then I'm good to go, right? And so you could do this kind of sensitivity analysis on your data to see how much you should put your faith in the vector representation that you have that then you're gonna use for recommendation system down the road. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so uh, network science is not my main field, so apologies if, if I've misunderstood anything. But um, I'm thinking it seems if your main, the main takeaway seems to be that the choices we make affect the insights we have, right? And so considering that, um, I have two kind of related questions. So one is like what should guide those choices? Because it seems to me that that opens up um, the fear that we find what we expect to find somehow, that when we're looking at different representations and choosing among them, we choose the one that fits what we expected to find in the beginning. Um, and leading on from that, are we looking into some kind of replication crisis in data science, similar to what we've seen in psychology in the last decade? Yes, so I would say the answer to the first question is, we as data scientists should care about the processes that are generating the data. Right? When you talk to physicists or biologists, they really care about where this data came from, what are the sample biases in it, et cetera, et cetera. As opposed to, well, look, I just downloaded this data, right? Or I collected it from my people, right? Like wh whoever has signed up for my app, right? But actually caring about, for example, the social processes that are happening that are generating your data can help you pick the right representation or at least an appropriate representation, right? So for example, if you believe that there's homophily, that like attracts like in your data, perhaps you should think about, is this homophily driven by selection or by influence? Because then the actions you make will depend on that. So for example, selection means you and I both like Apple products, so we become friends, right? And if you no longer like Apple products, then we don't become friends anymore, right? The, uh, the influence is that you and I are friends. I like Apple products, so then I influence you and you like Apple products, right? And so if you want to make an intervention on a social network, you really should care about how those links are being formed. What are the processes that are being formed? And of course, these are very complex. It's not just one process, right? And so that would be one of them, right? So to really just, I guess the main takeaway is two things. One is that your algorithm is not an island. Right, it is embedded into a big, we, we won, right? <laughs> we matter, data science, machine learning, AI matters now. And so we, we can't just think about, oh, I'm doing this little thing here because the algorithm is gonna be used and you don't know how it's gonna be used, right? And the second thing is just think about the data, that, the observations, the data that you're getting and where is it coming from? And we should be critical about that. The second one about replic replicability, absolutely. So what does it mean to be reproducible? <laughs> 
for that matter, right? I can put up some code from my paper. We always release our codes and some sample data. Maybe you can click on it and then you would get like the same figures in the picture, but does that mean reproducible? And in part, one of the problems is that um, we have a crisis of being honest <laughs> in data science, right? In, t in terms of, uh, the, because there's so much hype. When you write an academic paper, let's say, do you ever mention technical limitations? No, because if you mention technical limitations, then the reviewer is gonna say, look, the person themselves are saying these are the technical limitations, reject, right? But we should be honest. Like the same way our conferences like NeurIPS or all of these other big academic conferences are requiring us to think about negative societal impact, and I can tell you about that. We had another paper, I didn't talk about it today. Um, we should also have a mandatory section on technical limitations and assumptions. And if that's empty, your paper should automatically be rejected because clearly you've made assumptions and technical limitations. And I think at least that is one step toward being more honest and uh, saying, look, this algorithm is not a panacea. It's not the master algorithm, right? For example, it only works on these people, on this subpopulation. So that's great, but we don't want to do that. So yes, we definitely have a reproducibility problem. And I can tell you stories about actually working with the person and their student, having the same folds, and we were still not able to reproduce their, their results. And we didn't know why. And the difference was a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope I didn't run long.